Hey kids, Amy here with another mind-broadening Dueling Rabbits Productions video about a structure that is entirely new to me, Beiderwand. The narrow focus of this video is my first Beiderwand warp, what I've learned about the basic structure and how to set up the draw loom in order to weave it. The structure has proved strangely addictive, and my studies have raised a lot of questions and prompted further lines of inquiry. I'll be examining these matters arising in a short future video. For now, the basics. What makes Beiderwand Beiderwand? Let's look at the materials and construction of the classic version of the cloth to find out. Beiderwand is a member of the Lampas family of two layer tied weaves, in which two warps each interlace with their own weft. In Beiderwand, both layers are plain weave. In the basic cloth, the two layers are stitched together, but where pattern is being woven, the two layers are free of one another, forming pockets, as in conventional double weave. The first layer is known variously as the primary, main, foundation, or lower layer. Typically, the warp for this layer is bleached or natural linen or cotton, set to weave a balanced or somewhat warp emphasis plain weave, the weft for this layer is usually the same as its warp. The other layer is known as the secondary, binding, tie-down, background, or upper layer. Its warp threads are often finer than the warp for the primary layer, with a weft of lofty, contrasting wool, often in very dark colors. For illustrative purposes, here's a drawdown showing how the basic structure could be woven on a conventional single harness loom. I'm showing the primary warp in its customary white, but I've colored the secondary warp orange so you can see better what's going on. The primary warp is threaded across these two shafts at the back of the loom, alternating in the typical plain weave manner. The thinner orange warp is threaded across these two shafts at the front, also alternating. But you'll notice something interesting. The two warp threads are not threaded in equal numbers. We thread four primary ends before coming to our first secondary end on the first shaft here. Then we thread four more primary ends before coming to the next secondary end here on shaft number two. Four primary, one secondary, four primary, one secondary, and so on across the warp. Four primary ends for every secondary end. This interval is always expressed by a ratio, and the most common configuration of Beiderwand is this one, 4 to 1. Beiderwand is a two-shuttle weave. Down the side you can see picks of thick secondary blue weft alternating with picks of thinner primary white weft. This is the side of the cloth that bases up when we are weaving. It's the secondary layer, formed by the interlacement of the widely spaced orange warp and thick blue weft, giving a weft-faced appearance to the plain weave. You can just make out the white primary layer being woven underneath. The orange warp and blue weft are interlacing for plain weave, but the orange warp is also serving to tie the blue weft to the white layer below. We can see this interlacement more clearly if we change the aspect of our drawdown to show everything of equal size. Here are our secondary blue weft floats passing over nine threads, eight primary and one secondary, between ties. Our white primary warp and weft are also interlacing for plain weave, but here's another wrinkle. In order to get the math to work, the white weft must pass over two threads at once every time it passes over a secondary warp end, here and here, for example. Each secondary warp end effectively doubles its adjacent primary warp end and makes the stitching and unstitching of the two layers possible. This doubling is why a finer thread is often used for the secondary warp ends and why, when slaying the reed, the secondary warp ends are stuffed into the same dents as the primary warp. We'll return to this requirement a bit later on. If we look at the back side of the cloth, we can see the white primary layer more clearly. 
but when the cloth is woven in the basic structure, the white layer is not uninterrupted. We can see the orange warp floats tied to the surface by alternate blue picks, creating lines of color framing the four thread columns of the primary white layer. If I take away the orange and show the secondary warp the same color as the primary warp, which it often is, all our eye really sees on this face are lines of vertical blue speckles in a sea of white. These white columns framed by vertical specks of color are a distinctive characteristic of Beiderwand. So that's good as far as it goes, but since we are draw loom weavers, it is only half the story. We want to weave our cloth with elaborate designs. Let's see how to add pattern blocks to our basic structure. Here's a drawdown for Beiderwand with two pattern blocks. Again, this is the side that faces up when we are weaving. The secondary warp is orange again. Here are the blocks constructed from our weft-faced secondary layer. The opposite sides of these show the primary layer looking just like we saw earlier. But unlike the unit weaves that we've examined in other videos, such as Damask Double Weave and Summer and Winter, in Beiderwand our two layers are woven differently on each side of the cloth. The primary layer as woven on the top of the cloth is not the same as the primary layer as woven on the bottom. On the surface of the basic cloth's underside, the stitching of the secondary warp is clearly visible. Not so in our pattern block, where the stitching of the secondary layer to the primary layer does not occur. Where the primary layer appears as pattern on top of the cloth, the two layers are being woven independently. This has implications for the other side of the cloth too, where our pattern is shown as blue floats. On this side, the secondary warp is no longer stitching the blue floats to the white primary layer, but interlacing with the secondary weft only. This freeing of the two layers results in our pattern blocks being woven in true double weave fashion. On a draw loom, we weave pattern blocks by raising units where we want to reverse the faces of our cloth. But that won't work in the case of Beiderwand, because we need to unstitch our two layers in the pattern areas. The question is, how do we remove our tie-down ends from this equation and keep them from interfering with the primary layer when pattern leashes have been raised? The solution is a fiendishly simple one. We arrange our secondary warp so that it bypasses our pattern leashes and ground shafts and instead thread these ends through two bonus shafts at the front of the loom. By tying up these two shafts separately from our ground shafts, we can weave the secondary layer completely independently of the main layer when we choose. Here's a rough threading diagram to show what we're up against. The back of the loom is here at the top. We can see the pattern leashes here with four heddles each to reflect our four to one ratio of primary to secondary warp ends. Here are our four ground shafts with long eye heddles and our two bonus shafts at the front of the loom. The bonus shafts have standard 28 centimeter Texalt heddles. Here are my first four primary warp ends shown in blue. They are passing through their heddles on the first leash and continuing to the four ground shafts where they are threaded in a straight threading as usual, one, two, three, four. From the ground shafts, they proceed through the reed to the cloth beam. The next end, drawn in orange, is the first of my secondary warp ends. From the back of the loom, it bypasses the leashes and ground shaft heddles and is instead threaded onto the frontmost of the bonus shafts. It is slayed in the reed together with these four primary ends. More about that in a moment. These five ends are considered as a single unit for design purposes. Here's our next group of five. Four blue primary ends passing through their leash to the ground shafts where they are threaded straight. Another secondary end which goes straight to its heddle on the rearward of the bonus shafts. It too is slayed with its accompanying primary ends. Each five end group is threaded the same way, with the secondary ends alternating on the two bonus shafts so that plain weave can be woven on them. Let's head to the loom to see how this theory works in practice. First, I prepared my warps. 
For this project, I wound and beamed the two warps together, using 16-2 cotton for both. It's not unusual for weavers to employ a second warp beam for such structures, but, well, I don't have one. I reasoned that if differential take-up between the two warps became a problem, I would tackle it as needed. On my short, five-meter warp, the problem never arose, and that was that. I beamed the warp as usual, but came up against my first challenge when I was threading the pattern leashes. Here we are inside the loom. You can see all the warp ends coming off the back beam. And here's the leash I'm threading. Four primary ends, one each through four pattern heddles. I came up against my first challenge at this point. For a variety of regrettable reasons, I broke one of my own cardinal rules and wound my warp in a 3x3 three three cross, so nothing matched, and I was constantly having to break up my cross to complete my leashes. Lesson learned. When I finally came to the end of the leash, I confronted the next end coming off the leash sticks, a fifth end belonging to the secondary warp which must bypass the pattern leashes. I tried a couple of strategies to deal with these. The problem was they kept disappearing behind the pattern heddles when I was attending to them. In the end, I found a way to hold them forward with a heavy clip until I'd threaded enough leashes to knot the whole lot together temporarily. Next, I threaded my four ground shafts for the primary layer. These were outfitted as ground shafts usually are, with long eye heddles. But I decided to thread my secondary ends at this stage too and hung my two bonus shafts in front. These were outfitted with conventional 28 centimeter white tie heddles liberated from my big standard. Here's a typical repeat of 10 threads which will serve as two units when I start pulling pattern shafts. We've got two leashes of four threads each. Here's the first leash with its four primary warp ends. Next comes a fifth end straight off the leash sticks, which is a secondary end destined for the first bonus shaft. Next come four more primary ends, followed by another secondary end destined for the second bonus shaft. The four primary ends proceed through the long eye heddles as usual. This isn't too bad because every leash corresponds with one repeat of the straight threading. It proved challenging, though, for some reason, to remember whose turn it was when it came time to thread the pesky secondary ends through the bonus shafts. I did a lot of double-checking and persevered. Next, I slayed my warps using an 8 dents per inch reed. I slayed each one of my five end groups, four primary ends, and one secondary, in every dent. The thinking goes like this. The set for Beiderwand is determined by the primary warp, set for balanced plain weave or a little closer. I chose to set my 16-2 cotton at 32 ends per inch. In my 8-dent reed, that meant 4 threads per dent. But we always include the tie-down ends in the same dent as their accompanying primary ends. When I did that, I had 5 ends per dent in an 8-dent reed. This gave me a grand total of 40 ends per inch. After that, I continued as normal moving my ground and bonus shafts to the front of the loom, tying onto the cloth beam, and distributing my 32 pattern shafts. When I was all done, it looked like this. You can see both warps coming off the leaf sticks here at the back beam. But the secondary warp is floating above the primary warp because it is not weighted down by lingos, as the primary warp is. It's a little hard to see from here, but there's quite a distance between the two warps and I can even insert a warping stick between them. Here we are at the side of the loom. We can see the primary warp is on the bottom, here, passing through the pattern heddles and weighted by lingos. The secondary warp is above, bypassing the pattern and ground shafts as it makes its way to the front of the loom. The two layers gradually come together until they meet at the reed. Let's look at the placement of the shafts at the front of the loom. Here are the four ground shafts with their long eye heddles. The primary warp is lying at the bottom of the heddles. 
Here are the two bonus shafts with the secondary warp passing through their standard heddles. The bonus shafts are hung about one and a quarter inches lower than the ground shafts, so the secondary ends can lie comfortably in their eyes. The two warps meet on this side of the shafts. Tie up next. Couldn't be simpler. Two treadles for each warp tied up for plain weave. On my left are the treadles for the secondary warp, labeled one for shed one and two for shed two. On my right, the treadles for the primary warp, labeled for the two sheds again. The two secondary treadles are tied up to the two bonus shafts only. There are no connections to the ground shafts. Each treadle lifts one shaft and lowers the other. For the first shed, the shaft at the very front of the loom is lifted. For the second shed, the shaft behind it is lifted. The two treadles for the primary warp are not connected to the bonus shafts. The plain weave tie-ups are for the four ground shafts only. The treadling order for Beiderwand never varies. Secondary shed one, primary shed one, secondary shed two, primary shed two, secondary one, primary one, secondary two, primary two, always alternating are thick and thin wefts. In most sources, this is how the tie-ups are shown. But on my draw loom, I prefer a straight treadling whenever possible. So I change the tie-ups to make that happen. Now I can just treadle one, two, three, four, left to right ad nauseum and save my brain power for pulling pattern shafts. Now there is an alternate tie-up for this setup that requires the primary warp sheds to include the bonus shafts. This creates a variant structure that I will be exploring in due course. Stay tuned for my findings on this somewhat controversial topic. Let's attempt to weave some Beiderwand. First, I step on my leftmost treadle for the first secondary shed. Up comes the first bonus shaft. From where I sit weaving, I can see half the secondary ends come up. Look how sparse they are at the top of the shed. That's the 4 to 1 ratio at work. I throw my first pick of farrow wool for a row of the basic weft-faced secondary layer. Next, I step on treadle 2 to lift ground shafts 1 and 3 for my first primary shed. This is the first unit row in my closely set lower layer. You can see that here. I throw my pick of matching 16-2 cotton, which is barely visible on this side of the cloth. I step on treadle 3 and my second bonus shaft goes up, bringing up my alternate secondary ends. Another pick of my secondary wool weft and I complete the unit on the top layer of my cloth. To complete my unit on the bottom layer, I press treadle 4 which raises ground shafts two and four. A final pick of 16-2 cotton, and I am ready to start the whole process again. And that is how we weave the basic Beiderwand structure. Our secondary warp with its weft-faced plain weave above and the primary warp with its slightly warp-faced plain weave underneath. Although the white tie-downs are almost imperceptible to us as we are weaving, and will become even more so after wet finishing. The red tie-downs are clearly visible on the underside of the cloth. When we start pulling handles to make patterns, the cleverness of our setup becomes evident. I'm lifting lots of adjacent units so we can see what's going on. There we go. Now, when I treadle through my units, the unraised leashes and their associated secondary tie-down ends will continue to weave our basic structure. But where leashes are raised, the secondary ends, independent because they are threaded separately, are no longer brought above the primary layer for interlacement. This uncouples the layers and allows them to be woven as conventional double weave. If we peer in from the side and slowly press our secondary warp treadles, you can see the uninterrupted ranks of secondary ends rising towards our primary warp. The stitching action these ends perform in the basic structure cannot take place because they are no longer interacting with the threads in the raised leashes. 
Now I'm going to weave my four pick units with my leashes raised. I'm going to weave lots of picks so the structure on the big pattern blocks can be seen clearly. With this yarn and this set, my sampling demonstrated that four picks, two primary, two secondary, or one cycle through the treadles, gave me a square pattern and a nice supple cloth. Like damask, of course, the units can be stacked for different effects, as I am doing here. What I did find in my experiments is that when the pattern blocks are larger, their plain weave structure becomes less distorted by the columns in adjacent unraised warp areas. Although a distinctive feature of Beidervand and many older sources, this effect is considered undesirable by many contemporary conoscenti. Okay, I think that's enough. Let's remove the temple and see what we've got. It's pretty cool. There's our primary layer woven on the top surface of the cloth without a binding point in sight. The layers are only stitched together where our red secondary layer appears on top. The proof is in this cunning little double weave pocket where I can place valuable objects for safekeeping if I choose. Beidervand is a simple structure with a complicated history. With so few recipes available for the modern weaver, it lends itself to inquiry and experimentation. What happens when different weft thicknesses are used? How do different threading ratios affect the look of the cloth? What if we slay our reed differently or vary the tie-ups? What implications do these changes have for our designs? I've got a little bit of warp left and will report back soon with some more discoveries. Meanwhile, I would like to thank those weavers who so generously gave their time to help further my understanding, but must state for the record that any errors or inaccuracies in this presentation are mine alone. If you're interested in learning more about Beiderwand and how to weave it, both on single harness setups and on draw looms, here are some resources I found most helpful. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you again soon.